On April 29th, 2002, Season 4, Episode 24 of Blue's Clues, Steve Burns announced to the world that he was leaving for college and would be replaced by his brother, Joe. But that was a lie. The truth is, Steve Burns never wanted to be on children's television in the first place, and he was finally able to escape. But because of this lie, some disturbing rumors were brought to light. The most believed rumor was that Steve had died in a fatal car crash. A more ridiculous rumor was that he was murdered by the Blue's Clues producers, or died in an unsuccessful attempt to fight the Taliban. However, the most believable theory was that Steve was depressed, got addicted to H, and rebelled against the kid's show to start a rock band. And that theory wasn't entirely false. While the public saw a seemingly cheerful demeanor on screen, Steve struggled with his depreciating mental health off screen. I didn't know it yet, but I was the happiest depressed person in North America. I was struggling with severe clinical depression the whole time I was on that show. Steve's job was to be happy, uplifting, full of joy and wonder all the time. He had to pretend to be interested and amazed at the smallest things, like discovering Blue's paw print that was directly in front of him. He spent 10 hours per day filming in an empty Blue room so that he could be superimposed on the digitally animated world of Blue and her friends. At the time, technology wasn't as advanced as today, meaning Steve had nothing visual or tangible to work with. Steve said his experience was awful and compared it to acting at the bottom of a swimming pool. Pools are filled with water so stay hydrated. As if his experience wouldn't be any more taxing on his mental health, the insane things posted about him online made things even worse. Take this game on Newgrounds, for example, where your objective was to destroy Blue and then assassinate Steve. You eliminate the dog, then go into the house where Steve is flipping you off, so you shoot him until his head pops off and then the house burns down. He also had to read creepy fan fiction, like this one that romanticizes the idea of Blue assaulting Steve with a deadly weapon. For some reason, people love the idea of stripping the innocence away from a children's TV show and trying to create a disturbing narrative around it. To this day, TikTokers express theories that Steve is a drug addict living in a crack house and that his hallucinations cause him to talk to inanimate objects, which come to life. People also believe that the children's voices we occasionally hear are actually Steve's neglected children, helplessly watching him feed into his addiction. Or the reason Steve is excited whenever he gets mail is because it either includes the welfare check he plans to spend on more drugs or contains the drugs themselves. Most of the time, rumors like this are easily dismissed but for some reason, millions of people all around the world genuinely believe them. It's likely that even you have some random conspiracy theory about Steve embedded into your brain. However, most people just thought he died. An easy one to disprove, but it still worried him. I'm starting to think that maybe there's something people know that I don't know. In November 1999, the New York Times published an article detailing Steve Burns' time working on Blue's Clues and described the show's impact on children. Most notably, the article addressed the unsettling rumors surrounding Mr. Burns' well-being. The rumors were so prominent that the talk show host Rosie O'Donnell invited Steve to appear on her show. I died a whole lot of different ways, Steve recalled. Rosie's kid is a big fan, so I just went on and said, Hi, I'm alive. Bye. It was pretty easy to prove I wasn't dead. These rumors were so powerful that Steve felt the need to address Rosie O'Donnell's child with I'm alive because he knew children around the world were genuinely concerned about him. Because you have to keep in mind that Blue's Clues was the highest rated premiere of any Nickelodeon program and became crucial to the network's growth. It was a pioneer in interactive TV. The original Blue's Clues engaged its preschool age audience by breaking the fourth wall and speaking directly into the camera. Millions of kids around the world felt a deep and personal connection to Steve, which made these rumors more potent. It also made his exit from the show more detrimental. Mr. Burns was 22 when the show premiered, and as he approached his 30s, it was time to move on. Reveals the bold truth about his departure. I knew I wasn't going to be doing children's television all my life, mostly because I refused to lose my hair on a kid's TV show, and it was happening. Steve knew that his baldness would ruin his boyish look and appeal. The network insisted that he wear a wig, but he refused. Combine this with his depreciating mental health, it was finally time to exit. He told the viewers goodbye in his final send-off, alongside his new replacement Joe, and children around the world thought he was just going to go to college and he would return shortly. They were mistaken. Steve was not off to college. He was about to embark on his journey of being the lead singer of a psychedelic rock band. Steve was interested in music way before Blue's Clues. Steve Burns 
attended Boyertown Area Senior High School in Berks County, Pennsylvania, graduating in 1992. He played in bands called Sudden Impact, Nine Pound Truck, and The Ivies. He continued playing music on the side while pursuing an acting scholarship at DeSales University in the Lehigh Valley. Shortly after being discovered by an agent, Steve dropped out of school and moved to New York City to become a professional actor. In 95, Steve arrived in Nickelodeon under the impression he was auditioning for a voiceover role for a game show, but then later found out it was for a kid's show. Steve was a grungy 90s skate rock kid with long hair and earrings, not the ideal fit for the job. Tracy Page Johnson, executive producer and co-creator of Blues Clues, says that he didn't want to be a children's host. Of the 100 people we auditioned, he was by far the realist. He loved kids, but he didn't want to make a career out of it. Steve didn't want to be on children's television. He wanted to make music, and after he stepped away from the show, he could finally make his dreams a reality. In 1999, Steve walked into a party in New York where he heard the Flaming Lips 1999 album The Soft Bulletin for the first time, considered by many to be the Flaming Lips masterpiece. This moment changed Burns' life and reignited a passion for music he thought Blue's Clues had burned away. From there, he acquired Pro Tools and started writing songs. I had literally been doing nothing but talking to objects made of felt for six years. There was this weird creative constipation going on. Steve wrote roughly 35 songs in one sitting, but selected 12 to feature on his debut album, Songs for Dust Mites. Now it was time to get in the studio to record, so he contacted his favorite producer, Dave Fridman, who had worked with the Flaming Lips in the past. Interestingly enough, Fridman had just held a Blues Clues themed birthday party for his children, so he was eager to see what creative potential Steve had. Steve sent Dave some demos, assuming he'd think they sucked, but he got the opposite reaction. Dave liked it and he asked if Steven Drozd, the drummer of the Flaming Lips, could come and work on some music with them. In a dream world even Blue's Clues couldn't have imagined, the Flaming Lips wanted to work with Steve. The bassist, Michael Ivins, later joined the team as well, helping engineer several sessions. The lead vocalist, Wayne Coyne, actually approached Steve with the offer to star in a movie he was directing called Christmas on Mars. He was hesitant at first, but ultimately accepted the role. Because of Steve's ridiculous story of leaving a kid's show and starting a band, there was a flurry of interest from various record labels. He ultimately signed with Pius Records in late 2002 when a label executive sat him down and said, This makes sense. I don't know why, but there is a thread of logic between Blue's Clues, The Flaming Lips, and your record. And he was right. Something about the perfectly innocent image of a children's show, combined with the amount of insane rumor surrounding Steve, leading to being a frontman of a psychedelic rock band, was a crazy storyline. Burns professionally entered the world of rock music following the release of his indie rock album Songs for Dust Mites in August of 2003. Although the 12 track album did not garner much commercial success, it received praise from critics, as Pitchfork gave the project a 7.8 out of 10, and complimented Burns' lyrical insight and gift for writing and arranging endlessly listenable pop songs. You can actually hear one of the songs from the album, Mighty Little Man, as the opening theme for the CBS series Young Sheldon. Despite releasing music and starring in a horror comedy film called Nether Beast, rumors surrounding Steve's death resurfaced on the internet again. Burns told MTV in late 2007 that he was starting to take it personally. I guess the world would prefer that I was dead, but I'm not listening. I should really just create a website with my vital statistics on it. It could be live. There has to be a way I can hook up a heart monitor to my computer just to let people know I'm alive. To this day, Steve's Instagram handle is Steve Burns Alive, with a bio that reads, I've seen the meme. Unfortunately for Steve, he didn't exactly become the rock star he dreamed of being. Most of his buzz from his first project was earned due to the juxtaposition of his Blue's Clues career. After that, he started another band, Steve Burns and the Struggle, alongside the Flaming Lips Steven Drozd and a million billion frontman Ryan Smith. The collective released an album, Deep Sea Recovery Efforts, in 2009, but it failed to do anything substantial. For many years, Steve disappeared from the spotlight. Slowly but surely, rumors of his death, addiction, and God knows what else made their way back onto the internet. But in 2017, Steve got a call that he never thought he would get. Nickelodeon gave the original creators of Blue's Clues permission to develop a reboot of the series after multiple failed attempts. Nickelodeon posted a video announcing that they were looking for a new host of the show. Steve helped the creators during the casting process, and after 1,000 auditions, they eventually selected Josh De La Cruz, who was an understudy for Disney's Aladdin on Broadway for five years. De La Cruz would play Steve and Joe's cousin, Josh. 
Steve was initially reluctant to continue his association with the show, but was persuaded by its fans on social media to write, direct, and appear on the show. The reboot, Blue's Clues and You, has been a huge success following its premiere, producing four seasons before being renewed for a fifth early last year. Keep in mind, most people had no idea this even happened. Unless you have kids or very young siblings, you probably never knew that Steve returned to the show. But in 2021, Nick Jr.'s Twitter account posted a video for the 25th anniversary of Blue's Clues featuring Steve, and we all thought he had returned from the dead. Hi. You got a second? Okay. You remember how, when we were younger, we used to, um run around and hang out with Blue and find clues and talk to Mr. Salt, freak out about the mail and do all the fun stuff. And then one day I was like, oh, hey, guess what? Big news. I'm leaving. Uh, this is my brother, Joe. He's your new best friend. And then I got on a bus and I left and we didn't see each other for like a really long time. Can we just talk about that? Great, because I, I realized that, that that was kind of abrupt. Steve went on to explain what happened to his character, continuing the fake story of him going to college, because having a really unsuccessful rock band was not the narrative Nickelodeon wanted to continue. But his ability to speak through the camera and develop a one-on-one -on -one connection with the viewer resonated deeply with Blue's Clues fans. It's like we were all five years old again. The post was retweeted 700,000 times and liked by 1.9 million people. I think the overwhelming engagement is a huge testament to how powerful these rumors were over the years. Literally millions of people around the world thought he was a criminal, a drug addict, or dead. It's almost as if people wanted to believe them because the rumors were debunked numerous times over the years. So for him to essentially return from the shadows after two decades was shocking for so many people. This return finally put the rumors to rest. Steve Burns is not a child predator, he is not a drug addict, he is not a criminal, and most certainly, not dead. Although he didn't want to be in kids TV originally, he doesn't regret it at all. I hope I'll be remembered for that show for the rest of my life. That will always be a part of my identity, and I'm totally cool with that. Today, Burns travels to colleges around the country to speak to students about mental health because those rumors destroyed his, and now he's using that to help you improve yours.